knee pain, musculoskeletal diagnosis. When your patient complains of knee pain, without hearing another word, your differential diagnosis includes four basic etiologies. 1. Osteoarthritis. 2. Ligament damage. 3. Meniscus damage. 4. Patellofemoral disorder. Psanserinus bursitis, Osgood-Schlatter disease, osteochondritis dissatans, and fractures are among the other less likely causes you will need to consider. A basic history will help you narrow the diagnosis. Patient's history. Ask the following questions. Where is your pain? This is a very high yield question. Have your patient point to the most painful point, if possible. Pain at the joint line is the result of a collateral ligament or meniscus problem or both until proven otherwise. Pain at the tibial tuberosity in a young patient is Osgood-Schlatter's syndrome until proven otherwise. Anterior knee pain may be a patellofemoral disorder. Pain over the medial tibial plateau, approximately 2 inches below the joint line, may be pesanserinus bursitis, and pain and swelling in the posterior knee may be a baker's cyst. When did your pain begin, what were you doing at the time, and what were the initial symptoms? This is another high yield question. In fact, having already ascertained the location of pain, knowing the mechanism of injury and initial symptoms will give you the diagnosis and more. Then half of all cases of knee pain. If the patient has a ligament injury, the patient will report a deceleration injury or twisting the knee that led to immediate symptoms of swelling and pain. In fact, 30 to 50 percent of patients will report actually hearing a pop at the time of injury. In contrast, patients with meniscus injuries may have a similar mechanism of injury. Twisting or deceleration, but the patient will not notice swelling if swelling occurs at all until minutes or hours after the injury. There is a so no pop in sensation or sound in meniscus injuries. In an older patient, a meniscus injury may be more insidious and the patient may not recall an inciting. Traumatic event. Likewise, patients with osteoarthritis, patellofemoral syndrome, and osgood schlatter syndrome have a more chronic onset of symptoms. Patients with fractures will generally report a history of trauma. Do you experience any grinding, locking, catching, or giving way of the knee? This question is the last general high yield question for most cases of knee pain. Grinding is characteristic of osteoarthritis. Locking and catching are characteristic of meniscus injuries and osteochondritis dissecans. Meniscus injuries are much more common than osteochondritis dissecans, and giving way is more characteristic of ligamentous injuries. Are there any positions that make your knee more or less comfortable? This question is specifically targeting the diagnosis of patellofemoral syndrome. Patients with patellofemoral disorders classically report pain with prolonged knee flexion and pain relief with knee extension. The movie theater sign in which the patient complains of aching knee pain while sitting with the knees flexed in the theater for a prolonged period of time is classic for patellofemoral syndrome. Often, to relieve the pain, the patient will report extending the leg. What is the quality of your pain? Is it sharp, shooting, dull, etc? The answer to this question is most useful for gathering a general clue for the patient's complaint. It may not add any specific diagnostic utility, but it will give a better overall picture for the patient's problem. Have you tried anything to help the pain and, if yes, has that been successful? This question is more useful for when you are contemplating diagnostic tests and treatment strategies. Lastly, other important questions to remember to ask include. Have you ever had surgery on your knee? Do you have any hip or ankle pain? Both hip and ankle pain can refer pain to the knee, and vice versa. Having completed the history portion of your clinical exam, you are ready for the physical examination.
Observe the patient's gait as the patient walks back and forth across the room. Is the gait antalgic? Does the patient favor one leg over the other? This may not actually help you with the diagnosis, but it will help you gauge the degree of impairment, guide what imaging studies to order, and help form your ultimate treatment plan. With the patient seated, fully extend the patient's knee and determine the quadricep Q angle. The Q angle is formed by drawing an imaginary line from the anterior superior iliac spine to the center of the patella. This line is intersected by a second line from the tibial tuberosity to the center of the patella. And continue superiorly along the center of the anterior thigh as seen in the photo. The intersection of these two lines is called the Q angle. A normal Q angle in males is 10 to 15 degrees, and in females it is 10 to 19 degrees. An abnormal Q angle reflects abnormal patellar tracking and suggests an underlying patellofemoral disorder. Next, flex and extend the patient's leg and note the tracking of the patella. Excessive lateral tracking is another indication of patellofemoral syndrome. Palpate under and around the patella with the knee in full extension. The knee must be in extension to allow palpation under the surface of the patella. Tenderness in this region is indicative of patellofemoral syndrome. Then, flex and extend the patient's leg with one hand and palpate the patient's knee joint with the other hand. Crevitus may be an incidental finding, but it is also consistent with osteoarthritis and patellofemoral syndrome. Next, palpate the patient's tibial tubercle. Pain and tenderness at the tibial tubercle in young individuals is consistent with osgood schlatter syndrome. Palpate posteromedial to the tibial tubercle approximately 2 inches below the joint line as seen in the photo. This area is the pes anceronis, and it is the point at which the tendons of the sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus muscles attach to the tibia. A bursa overlies the insertion of these tendons and can become inflamed. Tenderness at this point reflects inflammation in the bursa. While the patient is still seated with legs hanging off the examining table, palpate the patient's joint line between the femoral condyles and tibial plateau. Tenderness along the medial joint line suggests an injury of the medial meniscus or medial collateral ligament. Tenderness along the lateral joint line suggests a lateral meniscus or lateral collateral ligament injury. Next, palpate the popliteal fossa and appreciate the pulsation of the popliteal artery. A small swelling in the fossa may indicate a Baker's cyst. Following this, test the muscles of the patient's knee by having the patient extend the knee against resistance as seen in the photo. This tests the quadriceps which are innervated by the femoral nerve, L to L4. Next, have the patient bring the ankle underneath the table, flexing the knee against resistance. This tests the patient's hamstring muscles, which are innervated primarily by the tibial portion of the sciatic nerve, L5, S1. The common peroneal portion of the sciatic nerve, L5, S2, innervates the short head of the biceps femoris. Next, Test the patellar reflex, L4. With the patient still seated, test for stability of the medial collateral ligament, MCL. Do this by flexing the patient's knee to 30 degrees. Next, secure the patient's ankle in one hand and cup the patient's knee with the other hand so that your thinner eminence is against the patient's fibular head. Place a firm valgus stress on the patient's knee by pushing medially against the patient's knee and pulling laterally against the patient's ankle. This maneuver is performed in an attempt to open the medial side of his knee. If there is an MCL injury, there will be medial joint line gapping that you will appreciate with the fingers that are cupped around the patient's knee. When the valgus stress on the patient's leg is relieved, the patient's knee may be felt to clung back together if there is an MCL tear. To test for lateral collateral ligament LCL tear, apply a varus stress to the patient's joint by pushing the patient's ankle medially while pulling the patient's knee laterally.
Remember to keep your hand cup around the lateral aspect of the joint in order to appreciate gapping, if present. MCL injuries are much more common than LCL injuries. Next, have the patient lie in the supine position while you check for an effusion. Look for a large effusion by pushing the patient's patella superiorly and then quickly releasing it. If there is a large amount of fluid, the fluid will redistribute and push the patella into its former position. If this happens, it is called a balladable patella. A balladable patella is a sign of a major effusion. Now, test for an anterior cruciate ligament, ACL tear. The most sensitive clinical test for an ACL tear is the Lachman test. The Lachman test is performed by flexing the patient's knee to 20 degrees and stabilizing the patient's femur with one hand and pulling the tibia toward you with the other hand. First, test the normal leg to establish the baseline endpoint. This is important because a few degrees of anterior glide of the tibia on the femur may be normal. Next, test the pathologic leg. Increased glide or a loose endpoint suggests an ACL tear. The anterior drawer test is a similar test that should also be performed to evaluate for an ACL injury. In this test, the patient's knee is flexed to 90 degrees with the feet flat on the table. The examiner sits on the patient's foot to stabilize it, and with the examiner's hands cupped around the back of the patient's upper calf, the tibia is pulled toward the examiner. If the tibia slides forward from under the femur more than a few degrees, there may be a tear in the ACL. If the patient has a positive anterior drawer sign or Lachman test, repeat the maneuver with the patient's leg in external and internal rotation. Repeating the maneuver with the leg in external rotation should tighten the posterior medial portion of the capsule. If the patient's tibia glides forward as much as it did with the leg in the neutral position, an MCL tear may be accompanying the potential ACL tear. Repeating the test with the leg in internal rotation tightens the posterior lateral capsule. If the patient's tibia again glides forward as much as it did with the leg in the neutral position, an LCL tear may be accompanying the potential ACL tear. To test for a posterior cruciate ligament, PCL tear, the examiner stays seated on the patient's foot as for the anterior drawer test. However, instead of pulling the patient's tibia toward the examiner, the tibia is pushed posteriorly. If the patient's tibia glides posteriorly on the femur, it is likely torn, although the PCL is rarely torn. The posterior sag sign is also used to evaluate for a PCL injury. In this sign, the patient's hip is flexed to 45 degrees and the knee is flexed to 90 degrees. The examiner supports the limb by holding the patient's ankle. In a patient with a PCL tear, the tibia will posteriorly translate on the femur. A few special tests are very useful to further investigate the meniscus. The McMurray test was designed to diagnose a tear in the posterior medial meniscus because the posterior horn of the medial meniscus is difficult to palpate. To perform the McMurray test, the examiner instructs the patient to lie supine with legs extended. The examiner then takes hold of the patient's heel and fully flexes the leg. Using the ankle as a fulcrum, the examiner rotates the patient's leg internally and externally to loosen up the knee joint. With the knee joint loose and fully flexed, the examiner continues to use the ankle as a fulcrum and puts the leg into external rotation at the same time as the examiner uses the other hand to push the patient's knee immediately, applying a valgus stress. The examiner then slowly extends the knee, maintaining the leg in external rotation and under valgus stress. If this maneuver elicits a palpable or audible click in the patient's knee, the posterior half of the medial meniscus is probably torn. Another good test to help differentiate between a meniscus tear and a collateral ligament tear is the at least compression and distraction test. To perform this test, 
The patient is instructed to lie in the prone position. The examiner stabilizes the thigh with one hand and flexes the patient's knee to 90 degrees with the other hand. The examiner then applies downward pressure to the patient's heel as the examiner internally and externally rotates the patient's leg, using the patient's heel as the fulcrum. This is the Apley's compression test. When this maneuver elicits medial pain, the patient may have a medial meniscus or ligament tear. When this maneuver elicits pain on the lateral side, the patient may have a lateral meniscus or ligament tear. To help differentiate the torn meniscus from a torn ligament, the Apley's distraction test is performed next. In the distraction test, the examiner and patient remain in the same position as for the compression test, but in this test the examiner pulls upward on the patient's ankle and, still using the ankle as a fulcrum, continues to rotate the patient's leg into internal and external rotation. This maneuver unloads the pressure from the meniscus. Therefore, if this maneuver also elicits pain, the pain is likely coming from an injured ligament and not the meniscus. Finally, test for osteochondritis DC cans OCD of the medial femoral condyle of the knee using Wilson's sign. OCD is a condition in which a fragment of cartilage and subchondral bone separates from an intact articular surface. In the knee, OCD occurs at the medial femoral condyle approximately 80% of the time. To test for Wilson's sign, the examiner has the patient return to lying in the supine position. The examiner takes the patient's knee and ankle and flexes the hip and knee to 90 degrees. Using the patient's ankle as a fulcrum, the examiner internally rotates the leg and then slowly extends the knee. At approximately 30 degrees of flexion, this maneuver most closely abuts the tibial spine against the medial femoral condyle. When this maneuver elicits pain at approximately 30 degrees of flexion, the patient has a positive Wilson sign. When a positive Wilson sign is elicited, the examiner next externally rotates the leg, moving the tibial spine away from the medial femoral condyle. This external rotation should alleviate the patient's pain in a true positive Wilson sign. If the patient's pain is not alleviated with external rotation, it may be a false positive Wilson sign. Having completed your history and physical examination, you have a good idea of what is wrong with your patient's knee. The following are some general recommendations for what to do next. For suspected ACL tear. Additional diagnostic evaluation. X-rays, including anteroposterior AP, lateral, and sunrise views, are taken to rule out fracture. Magnetic resonance imaging MRI may be ordered to better delineate the injury. Treatment, bracing, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and physical therapy emphasizing strengthening and stretching the quadriceps and hamstrings is first-line treatment. Depending on the extent of injury, surgical reconstruction may be necessary. For suspected PCL tear, additional diagnostic evaluation, X-rays, including AP, lateral, and sunrise views, should be obtained. MRI may be ordered to delineate the injury. Treatment, first-line treatment includes rest, ice, physical therapy emphasizing quadriceps strengthening and stretching, and bracing. Depending on the extent of injury, surgery may be required. For suspected MCL injury, additional diagnostic evaluation, x-rays, including AP and lateral views, should be obtained. MRI may be ordered when an associated injury is suspected. Treatment, First-line treatment includes rest, ice, elevation of the joint, physical therapy emphasizing stretching and strengthening exercises, bracing, and crutches until weight. Bearing is comfortable. Surgery is rarely necessary. For suspected LCL injury, additional diagnostic evaluation, x-rays, including AP and lateral views, should be obtained. MRI may also be helpful.
Treatment. First line treatment includes rest, ice, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and physical therapy emphasizing stretching and strengthening the quadriceps. Surgery may be required depending on the extent of injury. For suspected meniscus tear. Additional diagnostic evaluation. X-rays, including AP weight bearing, AP in 45 degree extension, lateral, and sunrise views, should be obtained. MRI should also be obtained to better evaluate the extent of injury. Arthroscopy is the gold standard diagnostic tool for meniscal tears but may not be necessary. Treatment. Small tears may be treated conservatively with rest, ice, bracing, and physical therapy. Larger tears and tears in patients who are competitive athletes and wish to return to competitive sport may require surgery. For suspected patellofemoral disorder. Additional diagnostic evaluation. X-rays, including AP, lateral, and sunrise views, should be obtained. Treatment, rest, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, patellar bracing and or taping, and physical therapy that emphasizes quadriceps stretching and strengthening and straight leg raising with the leg externally rotated to particularly focus on the vastus medialis oblique, is first line treatment. Surgery should be reserved for patients who fail to respond to at least several months of aggressive conservative care. Suspected osteoarthritis, additional diagnostic evaluation, x-rays, including AP, lateral, sunrise, and posterior anterior views with the knee flexed to 45 degrees, should be obtained. Treatment, conservative care, including rest, weight loss, when appropriate, physical therapy including non-impact exercises, such as swimming acetaminophen, NSAIDs, heat, Modalities, activity modification, ambulatory aids, such as a cane, should be used. Topical analgesic therapy with methyl salicylate or capsaicin cream may be beneficial. Oral glucosamine sulfate, 1,500 mg, and chondroitin sulfate, 1,200 mg, taken daily are also helpful. Intra-ARTICULAR injections of hyaluronic acid improve symptoms temporarily but typically need to be repeated periodically, about once every six months. Intra-ARTICULAR injection of corticosteroid and anesthetic may also be helpful. Surgical options are reserved for persistent or severe symptoms and include arthroscopy, osteotomy, and total knee replacement. Suspected prepatellar bursitis. Additional diagnostic evaluation. X-rays, including anterior posterior and lateral views, may be obtained to rule out a more serious underlying process. Treatment, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, activity modification, knee pads, and a corticosteroid and anesthetic injection may be helpful. Suspected psensorinus bursitis. Additional diagnostic evaluation. X-rays, including anterior posterior and lateral views, may be obtained to rule out a more serious underlying disorder. Treatment, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, rest, activity modification, physical therapy emphasizing stretching and strengthening of the hamstrings and quadriceps and A. Corticosteroid and anesthetic injection may be helpful. Suspected OCD, additional diagnostic evaluation, x-rays, including AP and lateral views, and MRI should be obtained. Treatment, conservative care includes physical therapy and bracing. Depending on the age of the patient and extent of injury, surgery may be necessary. Adults generally require surgery, whereas children and adolescents with skeletally immature bones may be treated conservatively. Suspected Osgood Schlauter's disease. Additional diagnostic evaluation, x-rays, including AP and lateral views, may be obtained. Treatment, activity restriction and or modification, an infrapatellar strap, 
and physical therapy emphasizing stretching and strengthening of the quadriceps and hamstrings are generally sufficient for treatment. Thank you for your time listening and watching. See you again next time for another musculoskeletal diagnosis quick guide presentation.